Friends, we continue to come to this Genesis text today, and, and I want to uh, share a little bit of introduction before I read the scripture, um, just to kind of put us in the story again and, and remind us of uh, the one who we have uh, uh, met with uh, last week and, and will continue to hear his story. But if you will call, God has freely given to the rascally Jacob the gift of land, the promise of a blessing, and the assurance of God's presence until the fulfillment of both that gift and promise. Jacob, in response uh, last week, bargained with God rather than offering God gift or promise in return. I had to go back and really kind of look that up because I thought, well, he seemed to say that he was uh, going to give a tenth of all that he had um, when he came into this promise. And, and then I saw it, that if you do this, God, then I will do this. Uh, and so that was helpful to just kind of go back and read the little small words uh, that often give us that sense that, that Jacob is like you and I, bargaining with God. But let us remember that nonetheless we know him to be the heir of the promise of Abraham. And so it is his journey that we begin to continue uh, following those great anticipations that we have. Uh, in verse 1 of chapter 29 it says this, this is the literal translation of the text. Jacob lifted his feet and went toward the land of Easterners. Now, as often happens in Genesis, he comes first to a well. Always the scene of community activity. Wouldn't it be nice to have a well <laughs> out here? Um, in the ancient desert world, the well was that, that scene where everyone gathered uh, for communal connection. A typical picture of that uh, would quickly be painted with uh, the three flocks that are crouching around this well. And we may wonder why they are not being watered at that point in the story, but they're sitting there. And so I think uh, the storyteller Michael Williams says, we can imagine that the users of the well have made a stone so large that it takes all of them to move it off the wellhead. Intentionally made the stone large so that it required more people to gather in order to remove it. In that way, we can be sure that no one gets to use uh, more than their fair share of this precious commodity, this precious source and resource of life. It's probably very much like the key systems that we have in our own modern banks where you can't get in without having several people um, opening up a vault. Uh, lots of important communal, cultural things that are happening when Jacob arrives to this well. And so then Jacob engages in conversation and discovers that they are from Haran. And remember, his father has sent him to his family. He wanted him to go and, and find family uh, to live with, to find a wife and, and to start his new future and life out of the threat uh, from his, his brother. And so he's ecstatic, I believe, that he's found his destination. And so they uh, have also said that they know Laban. And they tell Jacob that this is uh, Laban's well. So not only has he arrived, but the shepherds notice that Rachel, Jacob's first cousin and daughter of Laban, is coming now to water her father's flock. And when Jacob hears that Rachel is there, it seems that Jacob would be like uh, 
that he'd like to be alone with Rachel. So this is, a, this is all just the first part of Genesis chapter 29. But the shepherds aren't going to have any of it. Uh, we could not until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well to water the sheep. But Jacob just ignores all of their tradition, and he goes and he takes the stone off all by himself, like he's puffing up his uh, muscles, you know, he's already uh, thinking about his future and, and what he is about uh, in, in becoming a, a part of God's promise and, and the fulfillment of that. But I want you to kind of notice that um, in that story, there is some attention that G that Jacob gives to the sheep. So I don't know if he's after the sheep and Rachel all at once, but definitely he is taking it all in, looking at the fine flock that she is tending, and this combination, I believe, is, is proves to be a little bit irresistible to Jacob. And so he rushes over and he throws the stone off the mouth and waters Rachel's fine flock of sheep. After Jacob and Laban meet, a month passes. And that's where we pick up the story with our scripture today. So I'll be reading it from chapter 29. Verses 15 through 28. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, in the reading and the hearing and the digesting of your holy word. Amen. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go to her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you've done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the older, firstborn. Complete the wheat of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her wheat, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Bilpah to daughter Rachel to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow. 
Isn't that a marriage story if you ever heard one? In my family, we love to tell family stories. And I know that, that not everybody wants to hear everybody else's family story, but, but I do think that it's, it's very interesting. So I want you to think about your family stories and the things that you heard about how uh, your parents got together or maybe your own story uh, of coming together with another person. But in my family, um, we like to tell the story about how my parents uh, got, got introduced and, and um, and the tactic that my mother used uh, to um, get a hold of a, a, a collage that my aunt had made in her high school art class. So my mother taught art in Brazosport High School um, at the time, and my my aunt was uh, my to be aunt was one of her students, and she had done one of these collage uh, art pieces where you rip magazine. Uh, paper all into little teeny uh, bits and then you make a portrait out of it or you make some kind of, uh, for her it was a pot with all these flowers in it. And so if you come into my parents' house, it's always hanging on the wall and, and we love to tell that story of that's the picture that my mother married my dad in order to get. Because my aunt at the time said, when my mother said it, what are you going to do with that? I'd love to have it. Um, I'd love to keep that piece of art. It was, it's just so beautiful. And she says, well, my, my brother's coming home uh, from the Navy, and I'm planning on giving it to him. <laughs> so, so then the story kind of continues how uh, my grandmother, um, I'm a, my uh, paternal grandmother, uh, invited my mother over for a Sunday dinner. Um, and, and they met uh, at that time, and I don't really know the rest of it because what is the story that kind of happens in our family tradition is how it is that mother went to great lengths in order to get this collage uh, as her very own and, and had to put up with my dad for uh, 50 years for it. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have one of those kind of stories where we share and we pass down and we, and we think about the ways in which uh, plans come together. Uh, now, we tell that story in our family, uh, I think as a joking aside, I mean, it was, it was um, certainly not the only reason uh, that my mother um, ended up saying yes to my father. But, but it does bring me to this story of Jacob and Rachel and Laban and, and all that they're, they're bringing to the table, um, the ways in which Jacob apparently doesn't really understand his own cultural context and the tradition. Um, he's worked and, and lived with this family of his, uh, this distant uh, family, uh, for a whole month. And, and I'm not sure that anybody mentioned to him the cultural firstborn uh, thing, how that didn't translate in some other way. Or maybe he just thought he was just crafty enough uh, to, to make the request that, that he wanted and trusted Laban to do it. Um, there's many a commentary that loves to talk about how Laban's uh, deceit and trickster type of uh, way of being in the world was was a way for Jacob to meet his match, maybe do a little uh, personal growth and maturing when you face someone who uh, is better at your game than you've been. Those are the ways in which we bring our human hearing and, and wanderings and ponderings to the text. But honestly, before we get worked up about marriage practices in Genesis time, I want us to focus on the connection dot from last week. God made a promise to bless Jacob and his offspring. So this next telling of Jacob's dramatic story shows that God is able to offer the blessing and an offspring out of love that overcomes abusive power 
and deceitful posturing. Hear that again. God is able to offer the blessing and offspring out of love that overcomes abusive power and deceitful posturing. We hear the story has some questionable ta tactics to assure that Leah's prosperity is also taken care of. The description of the two daughters lends itself to that plot um, that had been in the works, I believe, for some time. And then again, who better than Jacob should be wary of a young elder, younger elder confusion? But he asks no questions, and he receives what he thinks is affirmation from a clever Laban. It's better that I give her to you than to any other man. Stay with me. And so Jacob worked for Rachel seven years, but they seemed to him only a few days. And here is a text that, that I just love, and, and I think it stands out. They seemed to him only a few days because of the love he had for her. It's justly a famous line. It's often viewed as the very epitome of romance if you're looking for romance in the scripture. But we should know better by now that Jacob's motivations are never simple and that his own interests are always close to the surface. But what about God in this story? See, there's something about that verse, because of the love he had for her, just seems to kind of speak of the nature of God even in Jacob, who we know is this conniving, uh, tricking, deceiving uh, person of God. He loves her, and he will do anything for her in order to be in a relationship with her. Sounds like the lengths at which Christ will go to be in relationship with us in some way that it might foretell and at least remind us of a character of God that has always been present uh, throughout all of Scripture. And that when Jacob set his feet after placing the ointment on the rock, and leaned into the promise and the gift that God had, had offered as land and offspring, as he kind of leaned into that, even with his bargaining kind of tone, he finds this other underneath plan of finding love and finding family. And he begins to be transformed to do whatever it takes in order that he um, may show his love for Rachel. I believe that sometimes when we get calculating in our own plans, when we abuse our own knowledge and power, um, I have to trust that even in the midst of our sidestepping and deceitfulness and the ways in which we frustrate each other uh, when we're not communicating effectively or, or we're taking assumptions that aren't held by uh, this, the parties that are involved, at the end of the day, if we step, if we're just stepping somewhere close to the direction of God's promise and plan, out of the love that God has for us, our story will continue to unfold and bring blessings, and we will be a blessing to those around us. You might want to consider today ways in which you've engaged in weird communication, false pretenses, 
uh, stepped into something faster before you didn't read before you read the fine print. Any of those kinds of ways in which we live in the world. But as long as we don't get beat down and and held in the shame and the guilt of all the ways in which we can be deceitful and calculating and and uh, overrun with our own assumptions, we just may be able to hear that what God loves about us has everything to do with who God is and that God wants to offer his love and it just seems like a few days because he loves us that much. The length, the depth, the width that God will go, that is the good news of this faith story. Even in the midst of our calculated plans, God is able to offer the love which we seek. God is always pursuing us with such love, and if we pay attention to the abuse of power and deceitfulness that can grow in each of us, it can be conquered for the sake of that same love. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, open our hearts to love that seeks us out and works tirelessly to be in relationship with us. Help us to outgrow our power struggles and, and deceitfulness, the ways we deceive ourselves and even deceive each other. Lord, hold us in your holy presence as our life unfolds with your blessing. It's in your Son's powerful and precious name, the Christ who gave his life for us, that we pray. Amen.